Uh, yes, so uh, just to reiterate what my uh, previous uh, presenters have been saying, thank you again for having me. Um, but I will dive right in into uh, lean design. So lean design, um, as we take it, means reducing material use safely through efficient and precise design. And um, my presentation today will essentially be um, a reiteration on uh, the article that I, I wrote for the iStructi. Um, so don't build upgrade existing buildings wherever viable, maximize utilization, interrogate your serviceability criteria, refine your loading criteria, um, design for use now, and then strengthen um, as the use changes. I think that's a really key one. Um, uh, carbon emissions that are emitted now are much more important and much more damaging than carbon emissions that may be released in the future. Um, number seven, concentrate on reducing your grids and floor slabs. Number eight, don't forget substructure. Um, so that's a really key one too. Um, nine, uh, avoid SEM1 designations. So we are using, uh, still using concrete, but there are small changes that you can make um, to make that concrete less bad. Um, and then number 10, keep learning, talking and sharing. So um, number one, don't build might seem counterintuitive, but um, I urge you all to read uh, the paper um, by uh, Tim Eibel, uh, James Norman and Oliver Broadbent. Um, they've said it a lot more eloquently than than I can. Um, this is in a previous um, uh, copy of uh, the iStruct D. Um, but essentially what I take being a structural engineer to mean is uh, we've got the skill, the capability, and the creativity to understand how the built environment um, works, that doesn't need to necessarily translate into building new things. Um, and it seems a lot more um, uh, important now, especially with um, COVID-19 has changed our relationship with the built environment. We're now, um, we don't necessarily need another school building when we're teaching our kids at home. Um, a lot of us uh, are working from home as well, um, home as our offices. Um, obviously, we need to uh, think about you know, spaces for creativity or spaces for collaboration. But um, I think our interpretation of um, how we use the built environment has been turned on its head. Um, and so now more than ever, interrogate the brief. Um, if a client comes to you saying that they want a new office building, you know, why why do they need a new building for this? Um, so yeah, a really key thing for us to for us to really uh, push and to lead on. Number two, upgrade your existing buildings wherever viable. So this is part of the structural engineers declare. Um, and you can create really quite unusual and interesting spaces if we um, work within the constraints of an existing building. Um, at the top of uh, the slide is um, the previous Montreal Olympic Tower, which has been um, created, uh, changed into um, an office building, but uh, that's quite a flagship sort of world-renowned example. Um, on the bottom is uh, a Bureau Happel project that we worked on with Urban Splash, which was uh, the conversion of uh, the old Wills Tobacco headquarters building um, into a one and two bedroom flats in Lakeshore in Bristol. So it doesn't need to necessarily be flagship, just you know, if you've got a, a decent safe structure that you can reuse, look to reuse it. Um, even if you can't use the whole thing, can you potentially reuse the foundations or can you reuse the cores, um, etc. Number three, maximize utilization. Um, so I know that we typically design for the worst case, um, but we should also really be designing for the best case to ensure that we reach minimum utilization targets. Um, and I, I don't think that this is necessarily the way that lots of people design for. We tend to look at the worst case. Is it safe? Cool. Let's continue. Um, but I think we should really start to target the minimum utilization rates. And if you are target, um, if you are getting a, a minimum utilization of less than 50% uh, at sort of stage two, stage three, or, you know, less than 75% at stage four, um, create a new beam type, a new column type, a new wall type, um, because that's how we can use material efficiently. Um, this does mean that we need to systematically build in loading refinement at each of our design stages. 
Um, but through communicating uh, that you need an extra, you know, a little bit of extra time here for material savings there, um, hopefully we can start to normalize um, just giving ourselves more time to, to do this um, and uh, translating the savings uh, through to the client and also, you know, the, the sustainability uh, benefits of that as well. Number four, um, interrogating serviceability criteria. So we should be doing this anyway, but if serviceability criteria are your limiting criteria, it's even more important. Um, do we need to have that one mil deflection um, limit for our facades? Um, can we have uh, deflection heads for our internal partitions? Um, potentially doing a, a quite a basic comparison of, um, you know, looking at your one one de mill deflection limit, how much extra steel work or concrete, et cetera, do you need versus um, if you did have your deflection head, how much steel could you be saving, timber could you be saving here? Um, I think this is a, a really key thing because, uh, because yeah, we, we could be throwing a lot of extra material uh, into our buildings to satisfy something that we didn't interrogate fully. Number five, refining loading criteria. So if you've got a, a bay that's greater than a 10 meters squared or more than three stories in your building, look to the, um, look to the Euro codes and look to make your imposed load reductions. Um, in terms of minimum imposed loading, I have included one of the um, images from the University of Cambridge from John Orr, um, which shows, you know, at full standing capacity of 29 people, you're still only really um, imposing a 1.4 kilonewtons per meter squared uh, loading on that floor. And they don't look like they're two meters apart either. So um, these kinds of things may change in the future. Um, Finally, having a clear brief and time for refinement um, is really important. I know that for um, for plant rooms, we typically um, assume a seven and a half uh, kilonewtons per meter squared loading, but um, more often than not, uh, handling units are or close to half of, of that at four kilonewtons per meter squared. So um, work with your MEP engineers, uh, see where you can refine those plant loadings. Um, it can really make some really key savings in the structure. Number six, design for use now and strengthen as the use changes. Um, we think that we're being sustainable by adding extra capacity during design so that the building is adaptable. Um, however, we are adding extra material now at an increased cost um, for the possibility that the function may change later. Um, we did a, a study on this um, at Beer Happold where we took a, a quite a typical um, concrete frame and we put in a, an initial redundancy by designing the floors for um, four kilonewtons per meter squared plus one for partitions. And uh, then we looked at um, a, a case where we designed it for a more typical um, office loading of two and a half um, with the uh, intention that you can add um, carbon fiber to strengthen in the future. And um, the design for future strengthening meant that um, we were at 90% of the embodied carbon um, compared to um, building for the initial redundancy in the first place. Um, and again, to reiterate, reducing carbon emissions now is much more important than reducing um, carbon emissions uh, in the future. Number seven, um, again, with reducing floor loadings, um, we want to be able to reduce the amount of material in our floor slabs. If you've seen um, our sensitivity studies, it's all about reducing the material in your floor slabs. Floors are inefficient structures, um, and you can do this through reducing your loadings, but also potentially reducing your grid sizes as well. Um, so these are all savings made um, for concrete, steel, and timber schemes um, going from a nine by nine grid down to a six and a half by six and a half column grid. Um, I've actually been in discussions with uh, the Brit British Council of Offices as well. So hopefully um, we'll be able to get some um, interesting guidance there because I know that um, larger floor areas are, you know, they're needed for, um, for a whole host of other reasons, but I'm sure that we can find the balance if we just talk to each other a bit more. Um, number eight, don't forget substructure. 
Um, so a couple of key points here. Um, try and avoid basements and suspended floor slabs if possible. Um, use your superstructure and the site to minimize foundations. So if the site is really soft ground, um, can you have a, a much lighter superstructure? Can you go down a sort of a steel or timber route? Um, can you use driven steel piles? Um, then potentially look to use uh, reclaimed steel tubing from the oil and gas industry. Um, again, this kind of draws, uh, the next point draws on the uh, serviceability criteria, but try and refine your settlement criteria um, where possible. And then also um, really, really try and push for timely and appropriately detailed ground investigations. Um, you want to be having the most information that you can about your ground um, before you design so that you can minimize the amount of material that goes into that. Number nine, um, avoid SEM1 designations. Um, we don't really need to have SEM1 in our, in our concrete. Um, you can have even small percentages of um, cement replacement in, our, in concrete and um, Typically now, if you go to to market, you do have at least um, you know twenty percent or so of um, of uh, some or some replacement in your in your concrete. Um, specify your fifty six day strengths wherever possible. So substructure potentially because you've got slightly different um, programs. Uh, use your appropriate strengths for construction load cases as well. Um, lower strength wherever possible and even with precast um, you can use limestone as a cement replacement as that has a minimal impact on strength gain and then finally to reiterate um, what John said uh, we need to keep talking learning and sharing um, we need to um, get uh, examples of uh, where we've done embodied carbon calculations of our projects and we need to share and we need to challenge each other um, against previous thinking so that we can move quickly and effectively um, to looking to, re you know, uh, do sustainable practices as our business as usual. So thank you. That's me done. Thank you, Natasha. Um, no problem. I think there was one slide left. Oh, oh yeah, there was one me. slide. Okay. It's just my name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but get, get in contact with me if, if you want to talk more. So, thanks. Excellent. Thank you. And bang on time as well. Congratulations. That's, that's <laughs> always good. Um, I mean, yeah, re really good presentation. Thank you. I really like the description of lean design as being efficient and precise design. Um, there's a you know a fine art to getting it right. And, of course, a lot of what Natasha is saying over, is going to overlap a lot with, I think, some of the uh content we'll hear about this afternoon regarding questioning the brief because of course if we're talking about small things like deflection limits and big things such as do you need to replace that existing building uh, that all ties in with questioning the brief doesn't it so uh thank you very much and hello to everybody listening um as will says we are based in bath we've grown to 25 strong over 20 years and the only point of telling you that is to say that this is not just for the big practices to tackle the majority of us work in practices of 10 or less and the big strides in carbon reduction are not going to be made by a few iconic projects they'll be made by all of us doing something small on each of our bread and butter projects so as a practice we've been measuring our carbon footprints for many years and we're really excited that as a profession we're getting together to measure carbon in a more coherent way now You'll see that most of the case studies I'll show you have carbon comparisons between different options using our own database. Um, and we're quite excited that in the future we should be able to share the information meaningfully between, um, between other practices, uh, which should help to improve all of our design work. So first things first, before we can start to discuss carbon with a client, we need to understand what it means in our everyday lives. Um, as an office, we have all done our individual carbon footprints, and there are lots of cal uh, cal cal calculators out there. Um, the carbon footprint calculator is one of the simpler ones, and it's a really good starting point. Um, so it spits out a pie chart, like the one you see on the right, with the distribution of various different parts of your life. So this is one of my colleagues who has, I'd say, a fairly normal life, um, lives in a three-bed terraced house, has a child, has one holiday a year involving a plane journey within Europe, um, and his profile comes to about seven tons of carbon a year. Um, and let's say he lives for 80 years, that would be a lifetime of carbon of 560 tons. 
And that starts to be useful when we start looking at building design. So under some case studies, we are by no means saying these are exemplars simply that we've been calculating carbon in our projects for a few years now. So we've built a library of really ordinary buildings and looked at how we can lean the design down in carbon terms. And it's led to some interesting lessons in how to talk about sustainability with clients and design teams and contractors. Um, and when I quote numbers in the case studies, we're not trying to be too clever. Um, I'm talking about that bit, the bit at the very beginning, the the cradle to gate. Um, and of course, as John has said earlier, there is a lot of work to be done on the other sections, cradle to grave, cradle to cradle, certainly, but we have to start somewhere. And this is the bit that I'm interested in and I'm gonna talk about today. So this is the tool we've developed in the practice over the last years. And obviously we now need to check it against the new iStruct guidance that John talked about earlier. Um, and what it is, is a comparison of different materials against kilograms of carbon per meter squared of building. And this is for a, this becomes for a fairly standard framed building with perhaps a seven and a half meter grid. Could be an office block, could be a school. Generally reasonably regular with some long spans, some more heavily loaded areas and so on. And it's the culmination of pulling data from lots of different real projects. And obviously every building you do will have different parameters. But what this tells you is that if you want low carbon, start with timber, move through steel to frame with timber, uh, with timber floors, and only go to concrete flat slab as your absolute last resort. Um, as the, the design refines, we can refine the carbon count for a particular building form, but this is a really useful starting point. So onto some case studies. Um, so this is Eastley House. Um, it's a pretty standard 1960s, 1970s concrete framed office building. And our starting point with every project is to consider what we can reuse. It could be the entire building. It could be the frame. It could be just the foundations. But we always try and reuse as much of the original fabric in situ as we possibly can. And I know Steve is talking later about reuse in more detail. But we can't have a discussion on lean design without having reuse as the starting assumption. So as is often the case, the cladding and the windows were leaky and there were long term carbon savings to be made in providing a better insulated cladding with better air tightness, um, which obviously speaks to what Beth was talking about earlier. Um, however, the concrete frame itself was in really good condition and rebuilding couldn't possibly be justified. So the cladding was slit, stripped and replaced. Um, the frame was saved and that gave an immediate saving of 330 tonnes of carbon. So if we demolished and built a new concrete frame, the concrete frame, the frame would have used 330 tonnes of carbon. And that information can and should be reported to the client um, so that they, they understand that, that the decisions they're making are really positive. Um, just one thing to watch, just slightly as an aside, um, when you're reusing buildings, people will say that adding a story is easy because foundations have spare capacity. And it's true. The foundations probably are fine. Um, what we found with buildings like this is that it's the stability system you need to check. So they are often very finely designed with cores and sway frames, and that's where you can come a cropper. So if you're adding a story or thinking about adding a story, worry about stability before you worry about foundation capacity. Uh, and just again, very quickly, another thing a, a, a worth considering is carbon fiber reinforcement readily available, very cost effective. So if you need to reinforce the slab around, say, a new stair opening, you can use carbon fibre where you would once have had to use a downstand steel beam. Um, and, and it's easy to get in, less of a risk in terms of site safety, much easier and needed to run services around. So it's a really useful tool in your armoury. So moving on to new build projects and moving one step up the carbon footprint ladder, this is a housing project called Lilac. It's in Leeds. Um, it's 20 new housing units built on a brownfield site. Um, in this case, sustainability was driven by the client body who wanted a community of houses which were as low impact as possible. So the houses are prefabricated timber panels insulated with straw and rendered in lime. Um, very, very airtight. So what's great about this project is that it's eminently repeatable. There's nothing particularly special about timber frame housing or brownfield sites. 
and and as I say, timber frame, like most off-site construction, achieves really good air tightness. So they don't have lots of gadgetry. They just need to be well built and well detailed. Um, I actually don't have the carbon numbers for this one because a lot of the numbers produced by other people included sequestration, which really muddies the waters. Um, but we do know it's pretty much as low as it's possible to be because of the materials used. Um, so again, taking one more step up that ladder again, this is a building we did for the Royal Opera House. It's their workshop and the place where they store all their costumes. Um, essentially, it needs to be a framed building with good light in some areas and other areas had to have pretty tight environmental control. In this case, the client and architect both expected us to produce a low carbon footprint. However, the costumes are on roller racking, which obviously has very, very tight deflection limits. So for this, we looked at a steel frame with either a precast concrete floor or a CLT floor. And here are the comparative figures for this building. You can see that you get a saving of 60 kilonewtons of carbon per meter squared going from precast concrete floor to CLT floor. So it's a 25% reduction in embodied carbon by going for timber. Um, the superstructure of the building is 25 metres long, it's 50 metres wide, it's over two storeys. So if we'd use precast planks, we'd be up at 625 tonnes of carbon. Um, with timber, we are at 475 tonnes of carbon. And putting that in personal terms, which I always think is useful and comes back to the carbon footprint thing at the beginning, if a lifetime of carbon emissions for a person is 560 tonnes, the building using precast planks is more carbon than you can use in a lifetime. Even with timber floors, it's still 85% of a lifetime. So obviously it'd be better to build nothing or to reuse a building, but it gives you a flavour of how what we do in our personal lives pales into insignificance compared to what we can achieve in our, prof in our professional lives. And obviously, again, this is the thing we should be you know repeating back to our clients and I, clearly i'm not absolutely not saying you shouldn't do things in your personal life to reduce your footprint but as will said earlier designing uh, designing buildings well is our bigger responsibility just a quick sideways move to foundations generally we find the best savings are made above ground because so much of foundation design is dictated by ground conditions and obviously a weight saving above ground structure will also mean the foundation can be lighter. But there are simple things we can do with foundations, fundamentally making them no stronger than they need to be. So if you're doing strip foundations onto clay, there's no reason why the concrete you use should be up at C40 strength. So simply by specifying C20, you can make a massive saving. So this is a random, I have to say quite ugly building, um, on which we did a comparison of foundation mixes Going from C40 down to C20 saved 30% in the carbon footprint. It's such a simple move in your specification and it has such a profound effect. So if we step up that ladder again and we're at the evil concrete end of the, of the project spectrum and we all find ourselves here sometimes, there are other things you can do. Uh, there are still things you can do, even if you have a client who's determined to use concrete or indeed a building which merits such a high carbon material. So this is a building we are looking at in London, which for various reasons ended up as concrete. And we looked at what we could do to limit its impact. So we looked both at changing the mix specification and also changing the type of slab that we used without changing anything that is in the design, but specifying 50% cement replacement we found we could reduce the carbon footprint by 23%. If we went to a ribbed slab as well, we reduced the carbon by 40%. And again, if we make it personal, there are 3.3 Western style lifetimes in the flat slab version of this building. By changing the spec, but still using a uh, flat slab, we can reduce that to two lifetimes. Sorry, if we're st still using concrete, we can reduce that to two lifetimes. So that's the rib slab. Um, if we could have done it in, say, steel frame and CLT, we might get this down to 720 tonnes of carbon, so 1.3 lifetimes. So between the concrete flat slab version and the steel CLT hybrid version, we reduce the carbon by 60%.
And of course, there are other changes you can make if you have access to the right contractors. This is a hotel we did in Bath where we designed the whole thing as RC flat slab on the assumption that it was difficult to get anyone who could do post-tensioned concrete outside London and because the client wanted to competitively tender the project. After tender, the contractor decided they wanted to use post-tension concrete, so we redesigned, so we could see the real saving, which was really interesting. And in this case, we reduced the slab thickness from 300 millimeters to 220 millimeters, which saved 209 tons of carbon in the superstructure alone. So how do we make these changes in real life? We have clients who start projects with a real understanding and a desire to build sustainably, but such clients are few and far between in our experience. More often, they're simply unaware of the impact their decision making has. Um, what we found is it's worth finding out what your client's aspirations are. They're unlikely to say they really don't care about the planet. They just genuinely don't have a language for describing what they want even to themselves, let alone their stakeholders, whether that's shareholders or staff. There's no doubt that it's easier to sell sustainability to clients who are building for their own use than it is to persuade developers. But everyone has a driver. It could be a shareholder who's always a bit painful about sustainable stuff, um, or it could be their teenage children who berate them for driving a big car. Um, either way, there's no doubt it's much, much easier to drive these ideas right through from conception to completion if you have a committed client. So spending time early in the project when you can have real influence and make much bigger changes like concrete flat slab to CLT. Um, and that's really, really worth doing. And later on, you can still make smaller changes like the finely designed beams or the cement replacements, and these things are all worth doing. But inevitably, the earlier you start talking about sustainability, the easier it is. And if you can make it personal to them, then do, it's more likely to stick. And the financial benefits are usually there too. CLT is quicker on site than concrete because it's prefabricated. Reusing a foundation gets rid of a whole stage of construction. Um, one of the mantras that we use with clients is that thinking time is cheap and building time is expensive. Design is an investment and they'll see the benefit if they if you can persuade them to make that investment. Um, and I hope I've shown that some very small make moves can have some big savings. Um, your carbon challenge, I would say, is start with your personal practice. Actively specify just one thing differently on your current project. Play with your concrete foundation strength. See if you can get some timber in the roof structure. Use precast planks rather than in situ flat slabs. Um, use the iStrict e calculator to work out what a difference it made. Tell your clients and colleagues what you did. You know, go to the pub, say, I saved half a lifetime of carbon today. Uh, and don't be afraid to play around a bit. We can't do all the things we'd like to do, but we can all do something. Um, work out your personal carbon footprint so you can help clients and fellow professionals relate to what you're doing in design um, to what you do day to day. Encourage understanding. Lean design has a greater impact than anything else we do and that's a message you've heard over and over again this morning already. Um, and as you get more experience and confidence, start, for, start to advocate reduced carbon to more sceptical clients. Um, as I say, thinking time is cheap and building time is expensive. Design is an investment. It's not a cost. Uh, and in the words of the iStruct E carbon guide, um, the, the uh, embodied carbon guide is do not let uncertainty deter you. Just give it a go. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Margaret. Yeah, do not let uncertainty deter you. Give it a go. I like that. I might get that on a T-shirt. Um, right, so we've got we've got a sort of nine or ten minutes. Um, we've had loads of questions coming through, um, so I apologise in advance. There's no chance we're going to get through all of them. Some really, really good questions in amongst all of that. Um, I think I'd like to start with uh, I think it's a question from Elton Tasha um, mm -hmm. about alternatives to the typical cement replacements that we all know and love, which is GGBS and PFA. So. Given that both of those are a sort of waste byproduct from uh, from something that is a you know a dirty industry as it were, yep. um, what what else can we use when when they run out or when we can't get hold of enough of them? Are there other alternatives 
of what I can replace cement with in my concrete mix. So um, there are already, uh, well, there have been alternatives um, being discussed for quite a few years. Unfortunately, it's because um, GGBS and PFA are part of large scale industries that they've been more readily available and had the supply chains um, in place. But limestone uh, as a cement replacement um, uh, is one option. And also there are certain certain clays and also certain ashes as well. So um, bio-based uh, like crop ashes can be used as cement replacements. Um, these haven't necessarily um, to my knowledge, um, been as readily available on commercial markets as sort of PFA and GGBS, but um, I'm confident that in the next couple of years um, we'll see more of those. Hmm. Great, thank you. Um, a question, question from Margaret. Um, I, it's from a commercial point of view. So the question is about you know the commercial side of lean design in terms of our design fees as a practicing structure engineer. It can be perceived as taking longer and more work to uh, design leaner and greener. Uh, I wonder if you could just share your views on that and how, as somebody who, you know, as director of a small practice, how have you coped with making sure that you, you know, you get the right, get the right work and it's done in the right way whilst also striving to be leaner and greener? Um, the reality is it is really hard. I mean, there are, you know, obviously there are some projects, where, you know, if you've got a client who's really up for it, that's great. You're, you know, you're pushing at an open door. Um, <clears throat> the developer type clients are more difficult. Um, we find that, I mean, again, it comes back to what I said about finding people's drivers. You know, if you can, if you can, in your early meetings, kind of find out what drives them personally, or indeed what drives them professionally, you can usually find a way in. And then you can start having a much more positive conversation about, oh, well, we can help you to uh, you know, tell your shareholders how it. You know, you can, we can give you more. It, we can add. We can add value. Add, I suppose, essentially. So, um, you know, if you've got, if if you if one of your shareholders is a pension fund and the pension fund is starting to say, well, what about sustainability? What about climate change? Well, we can help you with that. We can tell you. You know, tell you what. Would it be helpful to you if we calculated the embodied carbon and demonstrated how the building that you're doing and the design um, decisions that you're making are reducing the carbon from what it could be. Um, and if you can hook them in, then if, I mean, ideally, you know, we, we've now developed the tools that we can do it pretty quickly. And actually, we can do it within the fee. But ideally, you know, all of us, frankly, are asking for additional fee for that stuff. We can then say, well, look, if you just give us, you know, another day, we can do you a really good embodied carbon calculation and that's really helpful and we can do you a really nice you know a picture that shows that um and so it's it's really finding what what the driver is where's the hook where's the hook for that particular client and every client is different um, but yes it, it sometimes is really hard it sometimes is really hard to, to get them to see that design is an investment because so often you're you're down to what's the cheapest design I can do and 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 that's exhausting you know that's exhausting just in normal design let alone carbon near low carbon as well yeah absolutely um and I've got one thing I've always found is that you know th th there often is a link or you know usually is a link between material savings and cost savings so there, there quite often is the opportunity to be able to say to a client that you know of course if, if we could have a little bit longer to look at this in a bit more depth uh, so we can push all of our, you know, get our utilizations higher, get the structural configuration right before we start. It's going to save you money in material terms, and it's going to cost you slightly more in terms of our fees. But quite often that is so small relative to the cost of the frame you're going to build that, um, you know, it's just worth having the conversation, isn't it? Like you say, it's about understanding their drivers and trying to see where you can go from there. Yeah, um, exactly. Uh, I've got I've got a question that I guess there's a couple of questions coming in on uh, you know design designers and contractors. Um, so I guess this is kind of to both of you. So I'll, I'll give you both questions and maybe you can sort of choose how if you answer them together. So one of them is to do with early design and build contracts, and you know what can we do as a design team to make sure that the contractor undertakes lean design when they take over the design to find that extra 
20% utilization that Natasha showed us earlier. Um, and then there was also a similar question on, you know, what do we do to, you know, essentially stop a contractor from adding additional cement to their mix because it increases their, their program time. It means they can deprop sooner. Um, I don't know, Margaret, if you want to come in first on either of those. Um, yes. So I would say that that is where hooking your client in very early is absolutely critical, because if you've got a hooked client, then you can put, you know, thou shalt <laughs> get a 20 percent reduction in carbon, you know, into your specifications. You can, you know, but you, you absolutely it's very, very hard to do that in the absence of an engaged client. Um, to, to, if you've got a client behind you who's saying, yes, this is something that we want, that we can see will add value to our project, then you can start to put it in to your specifications and into the requirements. And you can, you know, you can ask questions about it at, at the tender stage and all of those sorts of things. Um, but very hard if you haven't got a, 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 a somebody on the client side who's really pushing it by then. Um, yeah. Sorry, what was the second question? Oh, adding cement 20%. Um, yeah, again, really hard. Again, I think it's about it, it's a lot of this is about hearts and minds. It's about nudging and it's about saying, you know, this isn't just I understand that it would be nice if you could save 30 days on your program. But actually, is it w would it really be nice? Because your client has already told you that they mind more about the, the planet than they do about program. So why are you trying to do it in 20 days less? Why not? You know, it's your kids as well, not just ours. Hmm. You know, let's work on this together. It's it's so much of it is is teamwork, hearts and minds, and getting everybody on the same page. Absolutely, excellent. Thank you, and Natasha. Do you have anything to add to either of those? You must have had to have dealt with the situation before, where the the concrete mix comes back and it's entirely different yeah. to what you were hoping for. And so um, definitely one with the uh, with the contractors um, changing the mix um, to save program. Uh, we managed to uh on a quite a small project um just have a conversation with what kinds of um activities they were going to do in the next three days um then in the next sort of fourteen days um and uh we determined that even though um yes it wasn't the twenty eight day strength that the uh concrete was achieving um in the in the pre agreed mixed it was sufficient for them and their construction activities. So we didn't do that knee jerk reaction of saying, oh yeah, just use SEM1. It was, no, actually, what, what are you going to be putting on this slab? Um, okay, so that actually works with this uh, strength gain that you get with our pre-agreed mix um, at three days. So yeah, it was just opening up that conversation. And it was it was solved in maybe two emails and a phone conversation. So, yeah. excellent, and everyone's everyone's happy.